the shooting range. In this episode, the Howling Vulture, the rise and fall of the Junkers 87. Too heavy, too late. The T-29 or how the Americans tried to build a perfect heavy tank. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you left in the comments. But first, let's start with heavy fighters and how to use them. Heavy fighters are not just bigger and heavier than the more conventional single-engine fighters. What really makes them stand out are the weapons they carry, and oh boy, do they carry a lot of them. One second burst masses through the roof. The increased firepower doesn't come cheap, though. This type of aircraft is usually relatively slow and unwieldy, which means that you cannot fly it the same way you fly any other fighter. There are two basic strategies. You can be on the verge of attack employing hit-and-run tactics, or you can help your teammates by shadowing dogfights and shooting enemies that are distracted. Or a little of both. You're the ultimate support, the heavy firepower. It takes you only a few seconds to eat through enemy bombers. You have loads of ammunition, and usually you're more robust than your single-engine teammates. All of that allows you to stay in battle longer than any other plane, making you a constant heavy-hitting presence in the sky. Avoid horizontal turn fighting. It is simply not your cup of tea. Head on, lots and lots of head on, that's what you need. Attack what gets in front of you, but don't chase down a single plane. Try not to engage in any maneuvers that make you bleed energy in general. Keep your speed up no matter what. Learn to take your enemies down by pre-firing at a distance of at least one kilometer. We've talked about this technique in one of our previous episodes, look it up. If you have someone on your tail, in most cases your best hope is to fly back to your base, let your teammates and the AA guns do the work. If you prefer to fight in the thick of the battle, plan your engagements beforehand, know where you're going, and know where you will be in a few moments. Heavy fighters are for steady folks who know what they're doing. There can be no hesitation, only swift, high-caliber justice. Now let's talk about the great American quest for a good heavy tank. After World War I, most tanks had to make do with bulletproof armor that protected the crew only from certain stray shell fragments and, well, bullets. But the emergence of quite a few good light anti-tank guns in the second half of the 30s changed the rules of the game. Today, these 37-45mm to 45 millimeter cannons are considered pea shooters, but then it was a completely different story. Less doubts were cleared during the Spanish Civil War. As a result, all the main tank builders started working on their own heavier tanks that had shellproof armor. That's how we got the Soviet KV, the British Churchill, and the German Tiger. Meanwhile, the American tank building industry was still at its infancy. Only in September of 1939 did they start working on a heavy 50-ton armored vehicle with anti-projectile armor. The new tank that was called the T-1 during the development phase and received the official designation of M6, but never engaged an enemy and soon disappeared from factories and army units alike. It wasn't a very good design. While having a similar mass to the Tiger, the American tank proved inferior when it came both to armor and firepower. Moreover, the designers believed that the only way to move these 50 tons of steel around the battlefield was with the help of a powerful 1,000 horsepower engine. Sounds good, huh? Well, you had to make room for such an engine, and that made this vehicle a bigger target. Long story short, the first heavy tank was not a success. In September of 1943, the Americans decided to have another shot at making a heavily protected armored vehicle now with a 105mm cannon. Despite its name, the T-28 Super Heavy Tank was more of a self-propelled gun. Yeah, it's a bit confusing. The vehicle that was designed to break through the enemy defenses turned out to be way too heavy, too cumbersome, and too late to see any actual combat. Finally, in the middle of 1944, the engineers built the T-29, a heavy tank that was supposed to hunt the Königstiger. It mounted the same gun as the T-28, but in a conventional rotating turret which was really massive due to the size of the gun and the fact that it required two loaders to operate. It was a very interesting and in many ways a truly innovative design. For example, the tank included an advanced drivetrain that merged transmission, steering system and brakes into a single unit. 
the T-29 E3 variant also got a large coincidence rangefinder forming the distinctive ears and the turret sides. The T-29 concept had two more major variations, the T-30, which was virtually the same vehicle but had a 155mm cannon, and the T-34 heavy tank that mounted a 120mm gun. For its time, these were decent tanks, but the end of the war curtailed further development. These vehicles were simply way too big, heavy and expensive to go into mass production. It was not all in vain, though. The experience gained with the T-34 was invaluable in the development of other armored vehicles, like the M-103. What do you think when you hear the word Blitzkrieg? Still rivers of tanks marked by black crosses? Check. Seas of soldiers in gray uniform? Check. And above them all, the unforgettable howling shadows. Junker City 7. History is not fair. The aviation pioneer, pacifist, and inventor Hugo Junkers had nothing to do with the development of the Junkers 87. The aircraft was conceived behind his back and entered production after the Nazi government forced Junkers out of his own company. It was not a bad plane, not at all. Thanks to Junkers' legacy, it was capable of precision bombing at high altitudes. A smooth-skinned all-metal monoplane with inverted gull wings and an automatic pull-out system had no difficulty outshining all rival designs. Yeah, to make the bomber more robust, the engineers ditched the retractable undercarriage in favor of a fixed one. But what difference did it make when the skies belonged to the Luftwaffe? The aircraft was easy to fly and could be manufactured in droves. It was also outfitted with the sirens the sound of which quickly became associated with dread and fear. It did not take the Junker 87 very long to become the symbol of destruction. It rained death on the streets of Madrid during the Spanish Civil War. Then it left its mark in Poland, Belgium, France, the Netherlands, Norway, Greece and the Balkans. But no reign of terror lasts forever. The first wake-up call for the infamous Stuka happened during the Battle of Britain. The British aviators fought like Kilkenny cats, and it turned out that the Junker 87 was not performing that well against targets that could fight back. Eventually, the Stuka had to be withdrawn. But that was the easy bit. Despite the initial success at the Eastern Front, the Stuka ran into serious trouble in the Soviet skies. The soldiers of the Red Army hated the bombers with a burning passion and were ready to go to any lengths to bring them down. The first Junkers 87 was shot down on the very first day of the German offensive. And when the Luftwaffe eventually lost their superiority, more and more Stukas turned into balls of fire with every passing day. Soon it became crystal clear that the Junkers 87 could not cope with all the new challenges. The Germans tried to repurpose it as a kind of an anti-tank aircraft, and the ground attack variant was being produced up until the middle of 1944, but that was only because there was practically nothing to replace it with. The days of the deadly German vulture were finally numbered. Now it's time for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official War Thunder forums. Here we'll have a more lighthearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. The first question comes from a player called I Has Banana. Hey Gaijin, how are you fellas doing? Have you ever thought about organizing professional War Thunder esports? I think this would be awesome to see. Hey buddy, we're good, how about you? There was actually a thing called Thunder League that we were pretty happy with last year. It's certainly not the last time we organized something of the sort. Maverick Porter asks, Hi Gaijin, 
Do you think a mobile release of the game could come in the future? Well, there's a problem with that. War Thunder is a complex game with lots of mechanics, processes and interactions that are really tricky to emulate on even the most powerful mobile devices. Not to mention that the game cannot be played if you don't have precise control over your vehicle, and mobile devices aren't really good at providing that, at least for now. The last message comes from a player called Nika Arabuli. We hope we got it right. Will you guys change the test area for tanks and planes? It's kind of lonely. We might improve it, yes. There are quite a few good ideas concerning the test drive that are circulating within the team, but it's not a priority. What you could do right now is go to live.worthunder.com and get some custom user-made test drives from there. There are some amazing works in there, too. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range.